we've got our foundation built with our springs and all of that stuff. Then we did our next video where we looked at the track bars and the stagger. Now it's time to fine tune our setup and really look for speed. Now you might be wondering, well, Tommy, haven't we been looking for speed in the other videos? Well, yes, but in the first two videos, which if you have not watched yet, you should go back and watch before this one. But in the first two videos, we were really dialing in comfort and sustainability over a long run. Now that we've got the car comfortable, we're gonna be dialing in this thing for our speed and to make sure that we can maintain speed over the course of a long run while maintaining that comfortability in the car so we can keep it as consistent as possible over the course of 100 laps. So in today's video, we're gonna be diving into the trailing arms, ride heights, shocks, everything else that we've got left to do to dial this thing in that last you know 15 20 percent of the way so now we will have a setup that we can actually take out and race with competitively in the super late models what's up everybody thomas brandon here thank you very much as always for joining me and like i said we're going to be diving into the last few steps here in building our super late model setup now like i said at the just a second ago, we're going to be taking a look really at the, the trailing arms, the shocks, and the ride heights. Now, I am going to actually show you also how to adjust your setup to compensate for weather changes because remember, we are at a 50% track, but we have the weather as hot as it. the track temp is like 135 degrees. It's super hot. It's right in the middle of the day, which I want to do with these super late models because if I can build a setup that feels good on this, then I know if it's a cooler temp track, all I got to do is make one or two adjustments and the car is good to go. So I'm going to actually show you that too at the end of the video. Now, really quick, if you have not watched videos one and two, please go back and watch those because if you don't do that, then this stuff is not going to help you. Now, if you are somebody that's like, look, Tommy, I already know that type of stuff. I'm just wanting to see if I can find anything else in terms of speed, you know, these last couple of steps, then hey, stick around because that's what we're going to be diving into today. Now, another really quick disclaimer, I am going to be using MoTeC for this. Understand you don't have to use MoTeC for this. MoTeC just makes it much easier for me. It saves me a ton of time um, with the, the workbooks and stuff that I've created. And so that's why I use it. But understand you don't have to use this. Okay. In fact, the data I'm going to be showing you today will be a good reference point for those of you who don't use MoTeC. So that way you can say, hey, look, I know that when I do this, it's going to be increasing X, Y, and Z. So I'm going to do that until I can't do it no more, or, or you know, I'm going to do it to this point or whatever. Okay. So I'm going to actually be sharing the data with you as well. So that way you can see what it does, because that's what a lot of people don't realize is the physics behind this stuff. We love to complain about all the iRacing, about all the stuff iRacing doesn't do right, but we ne we don't give them enough credit for what they do correctly. And th there's a ton. Okay. There really is, as you're going to see today, just with these super late models, the stuff that they've got, it, it's insane. It really is. So when we bought Boil it all down. It's pretty incredible the things that they've got, you know, going on in here. And I'm going to show you kind of behind the scenes with that um, as we do this. But first, let's head over to the garage now and let's get started. All right. So um, we've got some base laps turned and stuff like that, um, which if you're doing this all in, in, a, in a row, you've already got your baseline done. But you want to make sure that you've got a baseline um, laid down for where the car is at up to this point. OK, now for me. I'm really just looking to get a little bit more out of this car in terms of the handling. And, and what I mean by that is, is I would like it to roll the center just a little bit better. And then, you know, on my exit, you know, really have that, the, the, the drive that I'm looking for. All right. And it's hard to explain, but I've talked about this before. When I go into the corner, I want the car to go in nice and straight. And then I want to roll that center. When I hit that throttle, I want that car to drive out. All right. That's what I'm looking for. It's literally, it's like a dirt car. That's like, it's kind of how I want it to feel. Not kind of, that is how I want it to feel. So, um, I've got a couple of things left I can do here. All right. We've got our trailing arms. Um, we've got our shocks. Okay. Now really quick, just a note. 
there are a, a couple of things that have changed since the last video. Uh, the first one was the gear. So I've been doing a lot of testing for the new Insider program that we've got coming up for the Asphalt Oval stuff. And one of the things that I discovered was the gear. Um, I wanted to even have a shorter gear than I had before. I think we had a 458 um, last time and I'm at a 470 now. So I found that, you know, you really want to have a short gear in these things. Like hitting the limiter is not a bad thing from the testing and stuff that I have done um, and the data that I've looked at in Motec. So that's the first thing. Now, because of the gear ratio change, that did change my brake balance bar. Um, we were at like 51.3. It's at 50.1 now. So a change on the brake balance bar, because now when I let off the throttle and I'm on the brake, because I've got such a short gear, the gear is actually slowing the car down more. So I can compensate for that a little bit with the brake balance bar. But that's it. Everything else is still the same. The handling and stuff like that actually did not change with the gear ratio, which is good. Sometimes it can, sometimes it can't. Just depends. The first thing that I'm going to change here or that I want to try is going to be my trailing arms. So I actually use my trailing arms as kind of like a fine tune adjustment. If you adjust the trailing arm, it's really going to affect both the entry and the exit. Now, because of this, this is why I actually want to try it, okay? Because I'm going to try changing just one of my trailing arms, all right? And what I'm going to do is, is because I started with them at the middle, if you look down here at the bottom, it says higher mount, tighter corner entry, looser corner exit. And so what I'm going to do is, is I'm going to actually raise this right rear trailing arm to the top and I'm going to see if that's going to help the car drive through that middle and through that exit a little bit more because it's going to loosen it up just a little bit on the exit while keeping the entry tight. Now, here's the thing. If it helps the my middle and my exit, well, guess what? I can actually fix my entry by adjusting my shocks. This is why I'm changing this trailing arm first. I want to try this first. OK, so I'm going to go out. Let's turn a few laps. Now, right now we're in the fine tuning stage, so we're just going to turn a few laps. I just want to make sure to see if this adjustment helps, okay, if it improves it. It actually feels pretty good. Put it on the yellow line and see how it feels. Yeah, that actually feels really good. It did tighten up the entrance a little bit, but that's okay. Like I said, we can get that with the with a simple shock adjustment. So the car feels the car feels much better through the middle and the exit, which is really important. Uh, and it doesn't feel like we sacrificed a ton on the entry. The entry still feels good, which is always something to consider. I've talked about this before. Your entry is everything. If you don't have a good entry, you can't have a good middle and an exit, right? You got to have a good entry. So that actually feels really good okay so we're gonna roll with that now i do think we need to get you know a little bit more fine tuning out of it which is now where my shocks are going to come in so i actually really like those trailing arms where they're at and so i'm going to actually save this right now so i'm going to keep that now the next thing that we got to do is is we got to fine tune the shocks okay so my trailing arms are good right the springs are good the track bars are good all the everything else that we've talked about in the previous first two videos and up to this point in this video we're good now okay now we're going to actually dial in our shocks now really quick there is one more thing that we could do and that is the toe in and i will actually do this um with the when i'm done with the shocks if it's like god i just wish the car would be just a little bit looser on entry right something like like along those lines then i might do a toe in because that can be a really easy and simple way to get 
just a fine tune adjustment out of their car and it doesn't destroy the setup. Going from negative one 30 seconds to positive one 30 seconds can actually, you know, help your entry, right? In certain in situations and it doesn't change everything. And it's not going to destroy your tires, right? Like it's not a huge thing in terms of now your tires were wearing at, you know, just to keep it simple, 1% a lap. And now because you went to positive 130 seconds, now it's 5% a lap. It doesn't do that. Okay. So, so that is something that I will look at if I need to, in terms of like one last fine tune adjustment or a weather change. Okay. In terms of the trailing arms were good. Now it's time for the shocks. So the first thing that I want to change with my shocks is I want to compensate for what we just did with the trailing arms. Like I said, the entry still feels pretty good, but I can tell it's a little bit tighter. I do want to kind of free it up some on the entry. And if you look here, you have adjustments for both shocks, right? If we do both fronts or both rears. So for example, if I decrease the bump for both rears, that will loosen the entry or we can do a corner. All right. So what I want to do is, is I'm going to just do the right front. All right. I'm going to lower the right front bump because if I do that, that will help the entry. I don't want to do both right now. I just want to do one. Okay. Now we are at nine and so what i'm going to do is is i'm going to actually cut this number in half the reason i'm going to cut it in half is because i want to feel the adjustment first shocks can be so fine-tuned that if you're just going one click at a time you might not actually feel it in the beginning so i want to feel the adjustment to make sure that it's you know providing me what i want now if it's too much then i can start dialing it back so i'm going to go to four because I mean, 4.5 is te technically half of nine but we can't go half so we're going to go four and then what we're going to do is, is we're going to now go back out we're going to test now i'm going to go out and run some laps you don't need to watch me keep running laps and then i'll come back and we'll talk about it all right so um apparently i'm an idiot <laughs> um i did that shock adjustment that we looked at and I went out and I ran some laps and then I came back in and I started talking and I made another shock adjustment, ran more laps, made another shock adjustment, ran more laps. And I just realized right now that I forgot to restart the video <laughs> um, after those other shock adjustments. So here's what I actually ended up with and I'll, I'll, I'll kind of walk you through why. So the first adjustment if you remember we lowered the bump on the right front that felt pretty good that that in, that improved my entry it really felt good but i wanted a little bit more so what i did was i actually decreased the bump on the left front down to four felt good but then it felt like it wasn't like i couldn't get the left front down enough since that right front's now softer it felt like it was kind of picking that up still so i actually then went and went to zero on the left front that made it feel really good i was actually shocked how much better that felt and then i was trying to get my my drive off the corner you know really dialed in i went to nine on the left rear and man it, the car feels great it just feels awesome um i went and turned obviously i was like i said i was turning laps and i just turned my fastest laps so it feels really really good Okay, so I've got my shocks and my trailing arms both dialed in now. All right. And all I did, you guys, was I just used this guide. Okay, like I, I just used this guide. And if you've got the shocks feeling pretty good or you think the car feels pretty good with your shocks, you're like, look, I don't want to want to mess with the shocks anymore. There, you can do other adjustments, right? You can use these. If you want to get back into changing springs and stuff like that, go right ahead. I try not to but you can okay so that's the beauty of this thing it'll give you different options but for me the car feels really good now the only thing i've got left to do is to really dial in my ride height which is really going to give me some more speed believe it or not the even on these even on a, a half mile track your ride heights getting that aero profile dialed in can have a huge effect now to illustrate this i'm going to go out i'm going to turn with the current setup the way it is right now i'm going to go i'm going to turn 10 laps okay 
I'm going to show you the numbers in MoTeC and then I'm going to go out, I'm going to make a ride height adjustment and I'm going to turn 10 more laps and you're going to see the difference. Okay, so let's go and do that right now. We're going to save this as video three. And all right, I'm going to actually turn these laps with you watching to I'll kind of explain how the car's feeling. So turn on my telemetry. There we go. So like always, remember... We want to this first, you know, lap or so. We want to let the tires, you know, come up the temp and everything. It doesn't take that long when the track's 134 degrees. So, and right now, I mean, I can put this. You can see I can put that thing right on the yellow line, which I was having a, a harder time of doing before, and now I can literally just stick that thing right on the yellow line. And as I, oh, I overshot the entry there, but as I roll into the throttle, I can feel the car turning itself. And that's really what I want to feel. All right, we're just going to do this last lap here. Just need to do a few so you can see. All right. So that is our baseline, okay, of currently where we're at. All right. And now what I'm going to do is, is I'm just going to drop down the right heights. Now, before I do that, let's go to MoTeC and let's load up the data. All right. So as you can see here, we just did the, we just got two laps. All right. And the red lines, that's what we did. Now, if we look here, down here, this is where you're going to see your front ride heights. So first of all, we have ride height, uh, excuse me up here, ride height FL front left, ride height FR front right. Why they label it like that, I don't know. But these yellow uh, boxes with the white diamonds, that's showing you the average over the course of the lap. Then if we look down here, ride height FS, that's front splitter, okay? So even if the car doesn't have a splitter, right, it, that's still what that is. It's the front end, all right, the valence, whatever you want to call it. So our lowest point is 0.73. Our highest is 3.26. It's th almost is three and a quarter inches off the ground at our highest point. That's really high. And then our average is right at two inches. Now, I can get that much, much lower. Now, the way that we do this is actually really simple. All we're going to do is drop our packers down, okay? So we're not going to actually change the spring perch offsets right now. We're just going to adjust our packers first. And if we look at this, right, at our lowest point, we're right around three quarters of an inch. Now, with the super late models, you can actually get this number into the negative and not have it bottoming out, okay? So what I'm going to do is I'm going to actually, I'm going to drop this down to one inch and I'm going to drop this down to two inches. All right, I'm not going to touch anything else. I'm just going to drop those down. And now I'm going to go out and I'm going to run just a couple more laps and compare it. All right. Now I'm going to pause this because you don't need to actually see this, but I'm going to do this and then we'll come and look at the data. All right. So I just went out, ran a couple of laps. All right. And let me show you the data here in Motec. So the red lines that is with the ride height adjustment. So that's the one that I just did. The white lines are before, before we adjusted the ride heights. If you remember before, we were averaging right around two inches. Now we are averaging 0.64, okay? Now the lowest point was actually in the negative. All right, and you can see that this is almost a one-to-one Reflection. So what I mean by that is, is if you remember correctly, we had our shims, you know, we came down not a full inch. We came down like 0.8 or something like that. If you looked at what we went from the right front and the left front, right front was at like 2.8. Left front was at like 1.6 or 1.7, something like that. I can't remember, but that's where they were at roughly. We came down to two and one. 
And now you can see that we went from our low of 0.73 to 0.62. Now I can actually hear the splitter hitting the ground, right? I can hear it hitting the ground. And if I were to go out and run, you know, 10 laps, the ride height would probably be exactly where I want it. You can see we did not build up our pressures very much yet because we'd only done two laps. So I'm going to actually leave that where it is because it felt really good. They were the fastest laps I've turned so far. Okay. And the car just feels really good. But what I want you to see here is not just the, the ride height change because that was key. But if we actually go here to the aerodynamics, you can see that before we changed our ride heights, before we, and all we, we, we didn't even adjust the spring perches. All we did was decrease the packer. That's all we did. If you look at that, all right, our front nose downforce and rear downforce, and we want to be looking at the dynamics. So these first ones right here, front nose, rear spoiler, that's, those are more fixed. Okay. Meaning that they're based on the dimensions and the speed and stuff like that, all right? But the dynamics, that's actually based on the roll and pitch of the car, right? So when you hit the brakes and the car, you know, the, the nose gets down, all right, seals that off, it accounts for the, the, the nose being off the ground. So if the nose is off the ground by, let's say, two inches, right? Well, that's two inches that you've got of air coming underneath that nose. We don't want air coming under the car. We want to have as much as we possibly can go over the top of the car. All right. When you have it going under the car, you are now creating lift, not downforce. We don't want lift. All right. And not only are you creating lift, you're creating drag. Okay. So we want to get as much over as we can. If we look at our dynamic nose downforce, we went from 715 pounds of force on our nose. Okay with the Packers at what they were originally to 860 pounds of force. That is a huge increase in downforce on the nose. Huge. And you can feel the difference. Absolutely feel the difference. The front of the car is so planted now, it's not even funny. Okay. I mean, it really is. It's incredible how much easier that thing rolled through the center. This is why we work on the mechanical side first, get it there and then do this. All right. Because we want to get this dialed in, okay? Because this is really where we're going to find that speed. On the rear, if we look at the rear downforce, we only increase that, right, by uh, 24 pounds. But 24 pounds of increased downforce on the rear, when we didn't do anything to the rear, all we did was the front, right, is a lot. The reason why the rear is now increased is because we have changed the profile of the car. You see, if you think about an F1 car, for those of you who've seen F1 cars, right? What do they do? Well, they break the chassis, right? That's where they've got that. You can, you've seen the cars before where they rake the chassis. And what that does is it creates downforce on the entire car. Well, if you do the same thing to these, it's the same effect. Okay. It's the same result. If you're lowering the nose and you've got that spoiler now more in the air, now that air is hitting and it's pressing the whole car down. So being able to increase the rear downforce by 20 plus pounds of force is a lot, especially considering we didn't change the angle of it or anything. You know, we didn't change the spoiler angle, right? We just dropped the nose with our Packers. That gave us literally a difference of a couple hundred pounds of force overall. We were averaging 978 of downforce on the entire car. We're now at 1147. That's huge. Downforce is one of those things, especially when your tires are wearing out, that you are going to love, okay? It, it has an amazing effect on the car. And this is only a half mile track. Think about at a much bigger track, the difference that that can make. It's a huge, huge difference. Not only that, but if you look just at the lap times, right? It was... 18.7, 18.5, 18.5. All right, just look at the, the two best laps. 18.5, 18.5. We went 18.4, 18.4. I mean, it just, you're talking about a tenth of a second right there. And all we did was change our Packers. So huge, huge difference. Now, really quick, it's not 
perfect. Okay. And the reason I say that is, is like I said, the nose is, is, is hitting. So the last step that I need to do is I need to actually go out and run like 50 laps. I want to see when the pressures come up, does that thing level off and feel better, you know, throughout the entire run. And how is the tire wear going to be? Remember, we've been doing runs of 10, 15, right? Earlier on, I said, go out and do 20, 30, 40 laps, but we haven't done like a really hardcore run yet. And so that's the last step. We've got the car about as close as we can get it. The thing feels great. All right. It feels great. We've got good speed. Remember, we're at 100. And the track temp is like 135 degrees. Oh, it's gone down now. It was 134 when I started. I can't believe it's gone down that much, but it's still 120, still really hot. So it's a really hot track. Okay. So now I'm going to go out, I'm going to do like a 50 lap run. All right. And then we're going to come back, look at, the, I'm going to actually show you all the data in MoTeC, kind of give you an idea of what, what happens with these things as you do a long run. And then we'll wrap things up. So stick around. All right, so I just went out and I just did a 52 or 53 lap run. Uh, you can see all the laps right here. Uh, we went from 61 down to 113. So quite a few laps. Um, first thing that I want to look at is my tires. Now, I when I do this run that I just did, I am pushing the car to its max the entire time. All right. The reason I do this is if I can push the car to the max, all right, for 50 laps, and I've got a pretty good setup still towards the end of that 50 laps, right? The car still feels good, still got decent speed. Um, the fall off was about eight tenths of a second on average from the beginning of the run to the end. Now, keep in mind when I'm doing these runs, I am trying different lines. Um, I am adjusting my brake biases that, you know, I'm trying different things as the tires wear in to see if there's a way to make the car continue to feel better, um, you know, improve it, those types of things. So first of all, the ride height, uh, change that we did. Um, if we just talk about that for one second, if we go here to the ride heights, um, we still have our low, uh, negative 0.65 where we're bottoming out and that was literally here on lap you know 41 so the pressures came up but we're still bottoming out some okay um we're averaging 0.65 so do need to increase that packer just a little bit on the left front because that's where it's bottoming out uh, part of that's going to be because our left front shock the bump is zero right so that thing's just coming right down so that's one thing to consider Another thing, if we look at the tire pressure here, now that we've done a really long run, you can see on the right front, our camber, okay? Definitely need a little bit of a tweak there. And um, over the course of the run, all right, our tire wear, right? We've got a, about a 10% difference between the right front and the right rear. All right, which would indicate to me that my cross weight is still a little bit off. This is why I said in the previous video, you want to go out and do, you know, a 40, 50 lap run once you get that cross weight dialed in. Now, once you do that and you've got your shocks dialed in, stuff like that, it can affect the cross weight. All right, because it's going to affect your dynamic cross weight in terms of weight shift. Now, the good thing is, is that we don't need to make a huge adjustment. All right. We're literally at the final step of this. So what I'm going to do is, is I'm going to, because I need that right front to wear just a little bit less through over the course, over the course of the run, right? If we see 10% after 50 laps, that would be about, if we're looking at the numbers, a 20% difference over a hundred laps. Okay. Remember, I don't, I can't remember the exact number, but you want to do this based on what the length of the race is. So if we were to look at that, we'll just round this up. We'll say that this is 80 and this is 90. If we were to do a hundred lap race at the end of it, right? You're basically doubling that. Okay. So on average, keep in mind, 
the more the tires heat up, the more the wear and those types of things. But we're just looking at this, you know, in terms of like averages. So we would have about a 20% difference. That's a little too much. So what I want is, is I want less cross weight. Okay. So first thing I want to do is, is I'm going to increase this Packer shim just a little bit, man. We're going to go 1.188 on the Packer shim. All right. So that's good there. And now I want to decrease my cross weight some. So the way that I'm going to do this is, is I'm going to drop the left rear down two clicks, increase the left front two clicks, and then I'm going to drop the right front one click and then increase the right rear one click. Okay. And that took out 1% of cross weight. I'm going to do that one more time. All right. So now we're at 55.1. So we took out about 2% of cross weight, well, not roughly 2%. Okay. And so now I'm going to save this as V-3- Actually, we'll go 0.1 because I know that that will be the difference in that. And now we would go back out and we would run another 50 laps and see how it looks at the end of that 50 laps. So be right back. All right. So um, as you probably no doubt have noticed, things have changed a little bit uh, for you. It's only been a second, but for me, it's been about eight hours. So uh, where we uh, after that last. 50 laps. Um, I had to take the kids to school. So I uh, did that and I had to do a bunch of other stuff. And now back on, made those little tweaks and then um, went out, ran another 50 laps. And this is what it looked like. Let me bring up the garage and I'll show you. All right. So if you remember um, before the, the last 50 lap run that we did with our cross weight, before we decreased our cross weight, if you remember, our right side split was much, much different. We had about 78% on the right front and then the right rear was like 88%. Now, as you can see, we've got 85% and 88%. So much, much better in terms of our tire wear, which is what I want to see. Last time we had about a 10% gap, this time it's 3%. That's what I wanna see, okay? So that cross weight definitely helped with the tire wear and the car still felt really, really good. It wasn't too loose. It wasn't wanting to spin out. We didn't lose any speed or anything like that, okay? Now, in terms of the Packer that we did, I remember we increased that just a small bit um, so the car wouldn't be, you know, bottoming out so much. Um, if I pull up Motec, you can actually see here, if we go to the right heights, that we fixed that. The white line is um, what we did the previous 50 laps, the red line is this last one after the adjustments. Um, you can see that our low is a two tenths of an inch higher than our previous low. And so we're still in the negative, but with the super late models, you can actually be in the negative with these things and it not bottoming out. Before I could hear the, the nose hitting the ground, I could feel it. Now I don't hear it and I don't feel it. So we've got the ride heights dialed in. Our average is still below an inch, which is what I want. And we've got good speed. We've got good aerodynamics. All right. Our 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 downforce numbers are still really, really good. Uh, the rear is literally almost identical. The front, we did lose a little bit of downforce, but that's okay. You know, we lost about mm, 20 pounds. All right. If you think of the in terms of the initial ride height adjustments that we made, um, where we gained like a hundred and something pounds, we're still on a net positive. So everything right now is good. Everything looks good. Everything feels good. The car's got good speed. It's consistent. The fall off was around seven tenths of a second um, on average over the course of that 50 laps. And that was with me pushing it, you know, as hard as I can go. Now it's ready to race. This setup is ready to go. And what I will do is, is I will now take this out and race it. And the way that I will race it is, is that when I'm testing and building a setup, I will push the car to the, the limit, okay? Each and every lap. I wanna, I wanna push it as hard as I possibly can and get it dialed in. Once I do that, then when I'm gonna go race it, now I'm going to run the car at like 90% the entire time, or at least, you know, 80% of the race, because now I know that if I do that over the course of that run, I'm going to save my tires, but still have really good speed. And when we get down to the end of the race, 
if I've got something, right? If I'm maybe running up front or I have a chance to catch the leader or potentially even, you know, be the leader, win the race. Now I know I might have something extra in the tank in terms of tire wear or the other driver who might be pushing it to the max the entire race doesn't. So that's the game plan that I go into each race with. Now, does it always work? No, of course not. But it's been working for me well so far. So that's why I continue to do it. I have one, um, quite a few races uh, in on the asphalt side and when you compare it to the number of races that I've ran. So it's been, it's been, it's been working. So that is a good thing. Now, really quick, one more thing to cover is the temperature track temp. Um, obviously track temp has a huge effect on the way the car handles. So the way that I do this is actually really, really simple. If the track gets hotter, which remember we're doing it right now at like the hottest temp it can be at, um, these last 50 laps that I ran were at, you know, 123 degrees. And actually when I started this test session, it was around 130. So the track temp has actually gone down some, but it's around hundred, let's just call it 123 degrees. So only a couple of degrees warmer than what it was the last session that I did. Well, if the track is warmer, which there's a not a, a, there's a pretty slim chance that it'll be warmer but let's just say that it is if the track is warmer what i will do is i will drop my track bars evenly i'll keep the same track bar split but just drop them down that helps hook the car up more if the track is cooler let's say i show up to a race and now the track is 30 degrees cooler right and new smyrna this week is actually i think a night race or it's at sunset so let's say the track is like 30 degrees cooler. Well, now all I got to do is raise my track bars up evenly. And that'll help free up the car a little bit because obviously the track is going to be more hooked up. And that will allow me to keep everything else basically the same. And all I'm doing is adjusting my track bars. So that is how I've been compensating for the weather in these cars. Now, other cars, it's it's different. It's a different method. But for the super late models, that's the process. That's the thought process that I go into each race with when it comes to temperature and, and accounting for it and adjusting to it. Okay. So that's you guys, that's it, man. That's, that's how we build the setup for the super late models here in iRacing. So you guys, that's going to do it. All right. That's going to do it for this little video series here on the super late models. Um, I hope you enjoyed it. I hope it has helped you, you know, whether it's adjusting your own setups or the iRacing setups or even the free setups that I've got on the website or, or just building your own from scratch. I hope this has helped you do that um, more efficiently and have more success. I really do. I hope it helps you get to where it is that you want to go in the super late models on the asphalt side. And look, a lot of these are prints. A lot of these principles can be used in the other pavement cars. They really can. Um, you know, the, what I do for the Xfinity car or the next gen car or the, the trucks or, or the SK mods or whatever, it's the same thought process. It's just the components and things like that are, might be in a little bit of different order, but for the most part, it's the same, it's the same process. So this can work across multiple cars. So hopefully it has helped you, you know, like I said, build these setups in a much more time efficient manner because this does take some time and is time consuming. So hopefully this will help you cut some of that time off on the test track so you can get out there and spend more time on the racetrack. But that'll do it. Thank you very much as always for joining me. Now really quick before I go, do me a favor, like always, if you like it, hit the like button. If you don't, hit the dislike button. Let me know either way so that way I know what I need to be doing for you guys moving forward. Also, if you want to get this setup or any of the other free uh pavement setups that i've got head over to school of sim racing.net i'll have a link down in the description below so that way you can join our free membership and get access to the free setups we've got free setups for all the dirt cars minus street stocks and legends i don't drive those dang things um but all the dirt cars for all the tracks um we've got a lot of pavement stuff that's up there now too um in terms of free setups and things like that we've got you know, driving suits, we've got helmets, we've got all kinds of free stuff, setup guides, and it'll just help you get on the right track if you're struggling with anything and just help you, you know, like I said, save some time so you can spend more time racing, which is what we all want to do, right? No, nobody got into sim racing because it's like, man, I love to test, right? Like we got into it because we want to race. So the more time you get to do that, the better. And if I'm the one who has to be, you know, putting in the testing time so you get to enjoy yourself more, if it helps out the community, I'm all for it. So head over and check that out. 
also if you want to be notified of when we do future trainings or you know things like that have future programs that open up for example our insider program is going to be starting on the asphalt side here very very soon or my motec master class which i'm going to be doing here very very soon um, i was supposed to have it opened up already a couple weeks ago but with me getting sick and the infection and all that stuff like that that i had going on it kind of pushed everything back but that is coming here like in a day or two um, at the time of recording this that i'll be opening up the registration for that if that's something you're interested in you got to be on the email list because that's who gets notified first so if you're interested in that type of stuff head over check that out and finally join the discord community which is in my opinion of course i'm biased um the best sim racing community you can find online today hands down bar none but like I said, I'm a little biased. So, um, but anyways, that will do it. Thank you very much as always for joining me. And until next time, I want to wish you good luck, good racing, and take care.